John, I appreciate that. Nehemiah chapter 6. How many believe God's good this morning? Amen. Amen. He's a good God. Amen. And um, our enemy is a liar. And he will, he will try to use fear as a tactic uh, to get us out of the ministry, to get us out of God's will. And we're going to talk a little bit about this subject of fear today. So I want you to look at Nehemiah chapter number 6, if you would. And we're going to look down at verse number 5. And we'll work down through verse number 9 this morning. Nehemiah chapter 6. And look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, where it was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu, by the way, Gashmu is Geshem, uh, just a different uh, spelling there, different pronunciation. Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the law, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast appointed prophets to preach in thee in Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. I want to preach a message this morning that I'm going to entitle, I Will Not Fear. Now, we're in Nehemiah chapter 6, and I'll be honest, my intentions originally were to preach one chapter each Sunday uh, through the end of the year, and you know, God just had different plans. Uh, I started studying Nehemiah chapter 6, and I outlined four different topics in this section, and I planned to preach all of that last week. And it was like the Lord just put it in my heart. We need to pause right here for a little bit and just take one topic each Sunday for the month of November and, and hit that. And so last week we preached a message called I Cannot Come Down. And if you didn't catch that one, let me encourage you to go back and check it out on the podcast. Also on our website, Jeff's been posting the video of our messages as well. You can check that out. But today we're going to look at Nehemiah's response, second response, I will not Fear. Would you bow with me in prayer? Let's ask God to open our hearts. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for, uh, Lord, just for the good time of worship we've enjoyed together today. Thank you for these dear people who have taken some time out of their schedule on a Sunday morning to come out uh, from uh, the other things of the world and to set aside some time dedicated and devoted to you. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you for the young people that are here today. It's a blessing. Uh, Lord, to see young people in our church and, uh, Lord, serving you. Thank you for, uh, Lord, just everyone that's here. We're so grateful to be together today. I pray you'll unite our hearts around the Scripture. Use this message today for your honor and for your glory. Open our hearts now and speak to us. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah had enemies in Jerusalem. Some men by the name of Sanballat, and Tobiah, and Geshem were the leaders of of three individual groups that were coming against Nehemiah. These groups were collaborating to put a stop to the work that Nehemiah and the builders were doing. That is, building the wall in Jerusalem. And the efforts of the enemy to stop the building of the wall, to this point, they're striking out. Uh, they're, 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 while they've certainly been uh, determined and they've certainly, certainly been resilient, the enemies that is, to this point in the story, they have been unsuccessful in their attempts to stop Nehemiah. We read in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 10 about these enemies. The Bible says when Sandal, the Horonite, Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, that is, that Nehemiah had come to Jerusalem to build up the walls, it grieved them exceedingly. I looked up the word grieved. Uh, this week, and it simply means to be broken up. It means to fear. For more than 70 years, keep in mind, the nation of Israel has been in Babylonian captivity and also Assyrian uh, captivity. And during that time, the remnant of Jewish people that were left behind in Jerusalem were being taken advantage of. And they were unable to defend themselves against their enemies. And so when Nehemiah comes into Jerusalem to reestablish Jerusalem as a city and to reestablish the walls of Jerusalem, the Bible says that it grieved these men. It broke them up. It, it made them fearful. In other words, Nehemiah's choice to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem was going to directly impact these men. So in the first five chapters, we find them using various tactics and different approaches to put a stop to the work. I want to point these out to you this, this morning. Notice, first of all, the foolish 
approach. The foolish approach. They're in your notes. And I want you to take note of these uh, different approaches that the enemies have taken against Nehemiah. As we survey the book of Nehemiah, we find that the first thing Sanballat and these other enemies tried to do to Nehemiah and the people was to discount and to discredit the validity of the work that Nehemiah had come to do. In essence, they were trying to make it seem that Nehemiah and the builders, uh, they were doing a work that was absolutely ridiculous and meaningless and impossible is what they were trying to do. We read about that in chapter 2 and verse number 19 when the Bible tells us that when Sandal the Horonite, Tobiah the servant and the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, this was their first approach, they laughed us to scorn and they despised us. We also read in Nehemiah 4.1, it came to pass that when Sandal had heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and he took great indignation, notice this, and he mocked the Jews. The first thing they tried to do to stop the work was to make the work seem foolish, to make it seem ridiculous and impossible. In fact, they are mocking. The word mock simply means to ridicule or to deride. And so in the beginning of this work, their goal was to make it seem that what they were trying to do in building the wall was impossible. May I say this morning that we should be aware of this tactic of our enemy? Now, he will use this approach as an attempt to get us to come down off the wall. In fact, uh, it, this is an approach that is being used widely today, especially in the lives of young people. Young people, here, pastor this morning. The enemy will try to make what you're doing for the cause of Jesus to seem foolish. He'll try to make what you're doing with your life. If you live a life that's sold out to God, if you're faithful to church, if you live life a little bit differently and say, you know what, I believe that this is the Word of God. I'm going to live my life according to the Word of God. You know what people are going to say about that? Man, that's ignorant. That's foolish. That's impossible to live your life like that. Isn't that the truth? That they sure will. They'll use that foolish approach. If that doesn't work, we see number two, the fighting approach. We find that in Nehemiah 4 and verse number 7. The Bible says, But it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. Notice this. And conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Their attempts to make Nehemiah and the building look foolish have failed. And now the wall is beginning to take shape. Nehemiah has a great team of laborers, man. They're working hard. They're getting the job done. They believe in what they're doing. Things are moving forward. And so Sanballat now, since he couldn't defeat Nehemiah and the people through the foolish approach, takes the fighting approach. And he comes to physically hinder the work by harming Nehemiah and the doers. And again, this too is an approach that our enemy will use, the powers of darkness will use against us as we seek to establish a life that brings glory to God. This is why the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Amen. Look what the Bible says. For we wrestle. What do we wrestle against? Not flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places. But I'm going to tell you something. If the enemy can't get you off the wall by making you look foolish, if he can't get you off of the wall by merely fighting you, he'll use another approach, and that is the friendly approach. Everybody with me this morning? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, yeah. Our enemy, he'll use that fighting approach. Man, there'll be times when he'll use the foolish approach, but there have been times in my life where he used the friendly approach. And in desperation, the enemy shifts their tactics once again. And this time, he turns to diplomacy. He now invites Nehemiah to a conference where they would simply meet together. Nehemiah, I know we made fun of you in the beginning. I know we fought against you just not quite long ago. But Nehemiah, come down off the wall and let's just meet together. We read that in Nehemiah 6, 1 and 2 where they say, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ona, but they thought to do me mischief. So far, I love this, by the way. They've gotten absolutely nowhere with Nehemiah. Don't you love that? I mean, everything they throw at Nehemiah is just not sticking. Like, they try the friendly approach. They try the fighting approach. They try the foolish approach. And Nehemiah is still up on that wall getting the job done. Amen. 
But we've talked all through this series about how the enemy is resilient. Here we come to the fearful approach. This is what we want to talk about today. This item of fear. The word fear is defined as the unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or threat. As I was studying this word fear, uh, I also found on Wikipedia a, a very good definition that sort of uh, expands it a little bit and helps us understand it. Uh, they say that fear is a feeling induced by perceived danger or threat that occurs in certain types of organisms which causes a change in metabolic, uh, metabolic uh, and or organ functions and ultimately a change in behavior such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from perceived traumatic events. Now, as I think about fear, I want you to think back to the last time that you experienced the emotion of fear. Right now, in your mind, go back and try to think of the last time. Now, I want to talk to you about a, a moment of fear in my life. It wasn't the last time I had fear, quite obviously, it's been years ago, but it was one of the times that sticks out in my mind. I, I have a, a number of different fears in my life. I'm fearful of snakes, number one, so don't bring any snakes around me. <laughs> my dad used to always say, the only good snake's a dead snake, and I say amen to that. And if it's a dead snake, I'm not going to go mess with it just in case. You know, I'm going to be safe, and uh, I don't like snakes. Uh, many of you probably have some fear. Another one of the things that I'm not a big fan of is heights. Anybody else like that here this morning? Okay, good. I don't feel alone. Thank you. A couple of you are with me. Well, uh, if you, if you were to rewind back, I guess the year would have probably been 2011. I'm, I'm somewhere in the ballpark there. Uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to take uh, our young people from the youth group that we served in in North Carolina on a trip to Chicago, Illinois. And when we went to Chicago, Illinois, we visited this place, the big large building there. It's called the Willis Tower. Uh, we would all know, also known as the Sears Tower. Fun fact. Amber and I got engaged on the top floor of the Willis Tower, um, and so that's my romantic side coming out right there, and uh, we were above the clouds, the stars were shining, I got down on one knee and proposed to her that night, very special. We went back a few years later, and uh, in the Willis Tower, they installed something called the ledge. Does that strike fear in anybody's heart? It's called the ledge. Now, the Willis Tower is a building that is 1,000 450 feet tall, 110 stories tall. And in 2009, they opened something called the ledge. Now everybody, if you're, if you're fearful of heights, this is gonna make your palms start to sweat right here. But this is a picture of the ledge um, in Willis Tower in Chicago, Illinois. Um, my first time stepping out on this ledge, I think I nearly had a heart attack. Uh, it's literally a glass box that is off the side of the building, and you step out on that glass box, and you can see all the way down to the street beneath you, and as far as you can see from side to side. And it's just an amazing experience, and I'll never forget stepping out on that glass, being afraid of heights. And my hands, right now, my hands are sweating a little bit just thinking about it because I had that sensation of fear. Now, in case you have the idea that you'd like to go do this, I want to tell you that in June of this year, this is what happened. True story. Look it up and see if I'm lying this morning. Uh, but true story, there were people standing on the ledge when the ground beneath them began to splinter and crack. How many think that's the definition of fear right there, amen? Man, what a, what a time that must have been. We've all experienced moments of fear. And I think fear is very reoccurring and it's relevant in our culture. In fact, I, look up, I looked up a list of the top ten most common fears. Uh, and the top five, I'm going to put on the screen for you, number five, was blood or needles. All right? Uh, and the, number four was drowning, aquaphobia. Number three was bugs and insects. Number two was heights. There's me. I'm in that, in that group. And drum roll, please. Here comes number one. The number one fear... Uh, of Americans is public speaking. <laughs> this is from a, a post, uh, or an article rather, from the Washington Post of October of 2014. These are the top five fears of Americans. Some of these are kind of funny. We've laughed a little bit at the beginning of this message, but after the laughter is all said and done, can we be honest and realize this morning that many times fears that we face are legitimate? And they're not funny. 
And, and they're not something to discredit or discount. They're real. And there's really nothing funny about them. Can I just propose a few this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you have some fears related to your career. Maybe you're fearful of losing your job or maybe you have some relational issues that are connected with your job that are bringing that sensation of fear into your life. Maybe you're under the sound of my voice this morning and you, your fear is health related. Maybe you have some issues or you think you have some issues and your mind is consumed and, and you're constantly feeling that sensation of fear because of these health issues. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, my fear issue is financial and I don't know that I'm going to be able to pay the next bill. I don't know how I'm going to put the next meal on my table or how I'm going to pay the next house payment. Maybe you're here this morning and you have that sensation of fear connected with your marriage and you have some marital issues this morning. Maybe it's just simply the uncertainty about the future. I, I can't pinpoint every single issue. Those are just five things that I wrote down in my notes. But every single one of us have experienced or are experiencing fear of some sort. And the emotion of fear is something that is wide-ranging and it's wide-reaching. Stay with me right here. The problem of fear is that it's an emotion that is inward. But listen to this. It leads to a reaction that is outward. Can I say that one more time? Fear is an emotion that is inward that leads to a reaction that is outward. Do you remember the definition I shared earlier? They said that it is a fear, or fear is an emotion that causes a change in metabolic and organ functions. Look at this, and ultimately a change in behavior, such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from perceived traumatic events. And this is the danger with fear. And we need to be aware that, that this is the case. That our enemy knows that if he can make us fearful, it's possible, maybe even probable, that we will become less faithful. I mean, you're listening this morning, amen? Yeah. I, think God's, I feel like God's speaking to hearts already today. Our enemy knows that he can make us fearful. It's possible, maybe probable, probable that we will become less faithful. Nehemiah. Man, when you think of Nehemiah, you think of a great leader. You think of a strong man. You think of a guy who's resilient, who's leading a great army of people into victory and, and building a wall and doing great things for God. But if there's one thing that I think we can point to in the story of Nehemiah that was a downfall for Nehemiah, or we should say a weakness for Nehemiah, it was this thing of as a matter of fact, if we look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 2, the Bible tells us after Nehemiah has received the burden to go build the wall, now he's under the responsibility to go before the king, Artaxerxes, and to share with him about this burden. The Bible says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing that thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And note this from chapter 2. Nehemiah says then, uh, I was very sore afraid. In chapter 6, twice we read the word afraid in verse number 9, verse 13. We read twice the word fear in verse 14 and verse 19. And so Nehemiah was a man as great as he was. How many of you know that the best of men are men at best? And Nehemiah, if he had one thing that was a weakness for him, it was the thing of fear. Now today we want to look at where this fear originated as well as Nehemiah's response to the fear. Notice first of all this morning the unbelievable rumors. The unbelievable rumors. Now let's talk about rumors for a second, alright? A rumor is simply a currently circulating story or report of uncertain or doubtful truth. How many of you have ever heard the terminology of the rumor mill? You heard that before? Uh, I think it's very much connected to sports. A lot of times uh, in sports you'll hear about the rumor mill concerning a player. Maybe he's going to get traded or, or maybe they're going to sign this player or, or, or whatever the case may be there. But there's a, a rumor mill. And the problem with rumors is found in that definition that they are uncertain and that they are doubtful. And yet rumors can cause great harm. In fact, I was thinking about the sports analogy there. Did you know most players do their absolute best to avoid the rumor mill? Because if they began to listen to these rumors that are circulating in the media and in other, on social media and other places, those rumors can become very distracting or disheartening. So we see the unbelievable rumors. We're going to look at these. Letter A, we see the tactic. Look at verse number 5 with me, if you would. We see, first of all, the tactic. Then 
Sanballat his servant sent uh, sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written it is reported among the heathen and Gashmu again that's Geshem saith it that thou and the Jews think to rebel for which cause thou buildest the wall that thou mayest be their king according to these words and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem saying there is a king in Judah. Now clearly Sanballat has changed his approach. What was the last approach he used? The friendly approach, right? Oh, come meet with us, Nehemiah. And the Bible tells us that he sent four times to Nehemiah about meeting with him. And you know what Nehemiah said every time? I cannot come down. I cannot come down. I cannot come down. I cannot come down. And so Sanballat shifts his approach. As a matter of fact, if you look back at verse number 2, the Bible says, Send ballots sent unto me. Verse 4, they sent unto me. Verse 5, notice this. Then send ballots sent uh, uh, his servant unto me in light manner the fifth time. Now note these uh, few words. With an open letter. Now press that doesn't mean a whole lot, but let me explain very briefly what this is talking about. Uh, in these previous times, it would seem to suggest that he sent letters to, uh, to Nehemiah that were sealed or closed letters. Back in this day and time when they would write a letter, they would fold it up to about an inch in diameter, they would flatten it down, and they would take wax and put it on the ends so that it would be sealed. First reading, you might think, that sounds contradictory. Like, that makes no sense. Look what it says. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Look at the next verse. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. You're like, which one is it? Do I answer him or do I not answer him? The Bible says both. Answer a fool, answer not a fool. And I think what we see here with Nehemiah is exactly what the Bible was talking about in Proverbs 26. Nehemiah had to stand up for his character. Nehemiah had to stand up for the life and, and, and for the work that he was doing. But Nehemiah did not fall down in, onto the same level that said that was that Nehemiah did not answer a fool according to his folly in the same way. But he answered a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit. Nehemiah used discernment to know what was right and what was wrong. We see number three, the unrelenting reliance. And this is really the message today. Unrelenting reliance. Notice their desire in verse number nine. For they all, we're going to read verse nine. For they all made us afraid, saying, their hand shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, this is important. He says, they all made us afraid. What was the desire of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem? Let me give you three things, and I encourage you to write these things down, because these will help you this week. What was, what was Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem trying to accomplish in the life of Nehemiah by bringing these rumors into his life? Number one, to affect their hearts. Nehemiah says it. For they all made us, what's the next word? Afraid. Afraid. Remember, fear is an emotion. That's inward. It affects our heart. Why did they bring these baseless, baseless accusations against Nehemiah? Why did they contrive and invent and, and devise all these lies against Nehemiah? And it was because they wanted to affect the heart of Nehemiah. Because, this is important, our hands will follow our hearts. Our hands will follow our hearts. In fact, that's the second point. To a, they wanted to affect their hands. They wanted, number one, to affect their hearts. To get them afraid. To get them fearful. To get their heart pounding. To make that chill go up and down their spine. Thinking that they had something to be fearful of. Something that they had, to, they had something to be afraid of. And if it affected their heart, it would affect their hands. In fact, look what it says in the verse, verse 9. They made us all afraid, saying, this is what they said, their hands shall be weakened from the work. Man, this is powerful right here. The enemy was saying, if I can get them fearful, if I can get fear deep down in their heart, their hands will follow and they'll stop working. As a matter of fact, that's number three. That was to hinder the work. Three things, three desires from the enemy found here in verse number 9. Their desire was to affect the heart of the workers. Their desire was to affect the hands of the workers. And it affected the heart of the workers. And the hands of the workers, it would hinder the work. That's what he says right there in the text. 
that it be not done. Can I give you a verse here? Proverbs 4.23 Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. The word key means to guard. Guard your heart. Keep watch over your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. The Jameson Foster Brown commentary said it means with all diligence or above or more than all that is kept because the heart is the depository of all wisdom and the source of whatever affects life and character. Jesus said in Luke 6.45, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Why were they bringing these accusations? Why were they sharing these rumors with Nehemiah? So that it would affect their heart, which would affect their hands, which would hinder the word. Man, I've seen that happen in many lives in my ministry. People's hearts get affected first. And because their hearts get affected, it affects their hands. It affects their work. And because it affects their work, the job does not get done. Someone said it's impossible to do rightly while thinking wrongly for an extended period of time. What is inside will come out. If you want your life to be marked by righteous actions, you must think righteous thoughts. All their desire was to affect the heart of Nehemiah and the workers. Their desire was to affect their hands to hinder the work. But I'm so glad the story doesn't end there. I'm so glad the verses don't come to a conclusion. We see finally this morning his decision. Their desire was to hinder the, the work, to affect the heart, to affect the hands. But we see last of all this morning his decision. And don't bail out on me yet because we're just about done. Somebody says, Pastor, what was Nehemiah's secret for handling fear? You know, this could have been, I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. This could have been the turning point in the story of Nehemiah. Let that sink in. This fearful moment could have been the moment when Nehemiah thought, you know what, I, I, need, to, I need to go down and meet with those guys. I need to just stop working. I need to confront these accusations. I need to just put the pause button on this could have been the moment when Nehemiah quit. This could have been the moment when he, all the work uh, that was left undone. This really could have been the ending point of Nehemiah's life. This could have been a turning point in the building of the wall. But Nehemiah refused to give in to the efforts of the enemies. Now, how did Nehemiah deal with fear? That's the question we want to answer today. How do I deal with fear? Well, look what he said in verse number 9. Now, therefore, oh. God, strengthen my hands. Amen. Let me put this on the screen. Nehemiah remained faithful because he had the right focus. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah remained faithful. Why? Because he had the right focus. Did you know this wasn't the first time? This is so good. This might not be the best message you've ever heard me preach, but this will help you. You know, this wasn't the first time Nehemiah responded to fear. You remember we talked about Nehemiah 2, verse 2, whenever he's in front of the king, and the king asked him what's going on, what's wrong, and, and we read in verse number 2, the king said, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Nehemiah says, Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when this city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Don't miss this. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? Nehemiah doesn't respond to the king. Nehemiah says, So I prayed to the God of heaven. Amen. You know why Nehemiah made the right decision? Because he had his focus in the right place. Amen. You know, our 32nd President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, said this, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nehemiah, at this point in his story, could have lived in that fear. He could have come under the pressure of the fear of St. Bal and Tobiah and Geshem and all these false accusations and the fact that they were going to take those things to the king and report it to the king. Nehemiah could have become controlled by that fearful moment in 
his life. But instead of, of focusing on the, the, the circumstances and focus, focusing on the, the baseless, baseless accusation, Nehemiah hit his knees. Nehemiah lifted his head and he said, I serve a great God who is greater than Sanballat. I serve a great God who is greater than Tobiah and greater than Geshem. And he is a God that will strengthen my I want to remind you, write this verse down, Proverbs 29, 25. The Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare, the Bible says. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Amen. You know why Nehemiah did not live in fear because he lifted his eyes in focus to God Almighty. I wonder this morning, I wonder this morning if the reason why I or you live in fear is because we don't have the right focus on the greatness of our God. Maybe our eyes are consumed with the circumstances. Maybe our eyes are consumed with our, our difficult job situation. Maybe our eyes are consumed with our health problem. Maybe our eyes are consumed uh, with, with some other issue in our life and we've elevated it and we've magnified it and we've made it really, really big. In our eyes, maybe it's bigger than God. Maybe today you are doing what Nehemiah did and hit your knees and say, Oh God, strengthen my hands for the work that is to be done. Matthew Henry said this, When in our Christian work and warfare we enter upon any service or conflict, this is a good prayer. I have such a duty to do, such a temptation to grapple with, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Every temptation to draw us from duty should quicken us the more to do. I want to close this message today with Psalm 27 and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though the enemy may attempt to shift your focus to the circumstances of life, may I encourage you this morning to lift your head to the giver of life. Amen. Instead of letting the enemy get you to focus on the things that are happening here on the earth, can I encourage you this morning to lift your eyes to the one who created the earth? That's our God. He's a sovereign God. He is our creator. But more than that, if you're a born again believer today, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, you know the Bible says that He is your Father. And I didn't even put this in my notes, but this just occurred to me that the Bible tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear whereby we cry, Abba, He's not just sovereign God, although He certainly is sovereign God. He is our Heavenly Father who says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find grace to help in a time of need. Maybe the reason why you're struggling through life this morning, maybe the reason why you're having such a tough time and you walk in today feel, feeling weighed down and burdened and distressed and depressed and just discouraged with life is because you've been focusing on your surroundings and you need to focus on your Savior. Amen. Nehemiah responded by saying, I cannot come down. And this week we see his response, I will not Fear. Why, Nehemiah? Why will you not fear? I mean, these are potentially harmful situations. This is a bad set of circumstances, Nehemiah. Why will you not fear? Here's Nehemiah's answer. Because my God is great. Amen. And I close by saying this. If we truly fear Him, we will fear nothing else. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning.